The Nintendo 64 was a revolutionary piece of hardware. Alongside the original PlayStation, it ushered video games into the third dimension. It's home to many games that are considered all-time classics in their respective franchises and in the medium as a whole. Of course, with great games comes great villains. And which of these villains are the worst of the worst? Hey guys, I'm Brad with 1UP Binge, and this is N64 Villains, Evil to Most Evil. But first, today's video is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is an immersive game with awesome looking champion characters, each from their own factions with all sorts of deep backgrounds. For instance, take a look at the first faction you meet, the Banner Lords. One of the few totally human factions, their armor and weapons are based on feudal medieval knights. They're arrogant and warlike, but believed to be on the side of good, though the orcs, skinwalkers, and lizardmen would disagree. There is a lot of lore to explore, and that's one of the things we really like about Raid, the immersive world. Raid has tons of champion characters that each have their own interesting backgrounds, as well as their own unique skills to be used in-game. This month, Raid has a huge schedule of summer events, special fusion events to get a brand new legendary champion, tournaments against other players, and much more. They're also releasing five amazing new champions, and each of them looks badass. Raid summer plans are just starting to heat up, so there's really never been a better time to get started. But if you need more incentive to download, you'll get a huge bonus by hitting the link in the description, or scanning the QR code right here. New players will get the epic hero Chinaru, who's amazing in Doom Tower, 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard, so you can summon an awesome champion right when you get in game. You'll find your extra rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only, so you don't miss out. It's that easy. Just click the link in the description to get started. Thanks Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. We'll see you all in game. Now, let's get back to the video. Now, to clarify, we obviously aren't talking about every villain in every game. In order to keep things simple, we're only going to focus on the most iconic games and the main villain of each one. Also, for villains who appear in multiple games, we're going to focus on their appearances on the N64. With those clarifications out of the way, let's get started. Like always, we're starting with the least evil and working our way down. Starting with a character whose status as a villain is questionable at best, we have Master Hand. He's the final boss of the original Super Smash Bros. single-player mode, as well as the final boss of Classic Mode in all future games. While it's kept vague what force is bringing all these Nintendo characters together in future games, it's made clear that in this one, the entire game is just a kid playing with their toys in their room. So, Master Hand can be interpreted as a representation of the kid's influence on the game. On one hand, this means Master Hand is a source of all conflict, so that's enough for him to be on the list. On the other hand, though, all of this is just a kid playing pretend in their bedroom, and there's nothing evil about that, which is why he's at the start of the list. Moving on to villains who actually have ill intentions, let's start with one who's relatively harmless, Baby Bowser. We're counting him as a separate character from his adult self. As a kid, Bowser was a petulant troublemaker, and his appearance in Yoshi's story is no exception. All the Yoshis of Yoshi's Island lived peaceful, happy lives, until Baby Bowser got jealous and stole the source of their happiness, the Super Happy Tree, and turned their island into a pop-up book. Baby Bowser ranks low on the list, mostly because it's tough to tell how much damage he really does. Having your island turn into a pop-up book certainly isn't pleasant, but the Yoshis seem to get around just fine, so it's probably more of an inconvenience. As for the super happy tree, we don't know if the tree simply made them happier, or if they're physically unable to experience happiness without it. Given how chipper Yoshi appears in basically every other game, despite this tree being nowhere to be seen, we're inclined to believe the former. In the end, Baby Bowser may be an antagonist, but he doesn't go beyond schoolyard bully territory. Up next is Lex Luthor, from the beloved classic Superman 64. I mean, everyone loves this game, right? Why else would they talk about it so much? Okay, in all seriousness, thanks to this game's infamy, Superman 64 is about as iconic as most of the games on this list, just for the wrong reasons. But enough about the actual game. Lex Luthor is a character with a rich history of destructive evil schemes. His plan in this game isn't one of them. 
In Superman 64, Luthor kidnaps three of Superman's closest friends and puts them in a simulated version of Metropolis. That's right, aside from Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, and Professor Emil Hamilton, everyone Superman saves in this game isn't real. Okay, imprisoning three people and using that to trap mankind's savior is certainly an evil thing to do, but those are the only people at risk. In some ways, Luthor's plans can even be considered helpful to humanity. In order to guard Superman's friends, Luthor brought in highly dangerous villains like Brainiac and Darkseid. Considering how much destruction these villains can cause when left to their own devices, wasting their time with such a pointless and relatively harmless scheme is arguably a public service. Once again, that doesn't justify anything he did, but it could have been a lot worse. Up next is the villain who's appeared in more games on the N64 than anyone else on this list, Bowser. Even limiting this to the crimes he commits on the N64, there's still a lot here. In Super Mario 64, he kidnaps Princess Peach and takes over her castle. In Paper Mario, he does the same thing, albeit more aggressively, as he literally lifts the castle into the sky. He also steals the Star Rod and imprisons all the Star Spirits, ensuring only his wishes come true. Finally, in the Mario Party games, Bowser will sabotage players who land on his spaces in a variety of ways. Due to the nature of Mario Party, it's possible that Bowser's just doing his job, and everyone agreed to do this in advance, but that still doesn't erase his other acts of villainy. Kidnapping a nation's ruler is a pretty serious offense, as is stealing all the world's wishes. But Bowser has some redeeming qualities too. Personality-wise, he's a fairly nice guy, often treating his subordinates with respect and allowing Peach to feel comfortable while she's held captive. This doesn't make up for the evil he's done, but it does lessen the impact and keeps him from being higher on the list. Up next is the Panther King from Conker's Bad Fur Day. Conker is a game where just about everything is raunchy and ridiculous, and the main villain is no exception. The game begins with the Panther King spilling a glass of milk because his coffee table is missing a leg, and he sends his troop after Conker because he's just the right size to fill the gap. This plan is idiotic and shows that he's not just an idiot, but a dangerous idiot. He's also a brutal tyrant, ordering around the weasels and threatening them with duct tape after conquering their kingdom. It's also implied that he originally allied with the squirrels in the war against the weasels and betrayed them after going mad with power. The Panther King would rank a lot higher on this list if he wasn't so single-minded. He only cares about drinking milk and fixing his table, so his evil ambitions aren't exactly grand in scale. Still, the people whose lives he does affect have it pretty rough. He may be more of a movie villain than a video game villain, but it would be crazy not to include Alec Trevelyan from GoldenEye. Considering GoldenEye was a massive step forward for first-person shooters, there's a good chance the game is more iconic than the movie at this point. As for Alec, he was an MI6 agent before faking his death and starting a crime syndicate under the alias Janus. During this time, he hijacked a Soviet space weapon known as GoldenEye for the sake of his master plan. He planned to steal billions from the Bank of England and transfer them to other organizations before using the electronic pulses generated by GoldenEye to destroy all records of the theft and annihilate Britain's economy. Alec's goal may not be to kill people, but that doesn't mean a bunch of people don't die. In addition to all the people he's killed with his regular crime, there is the many that would have died if he was able to fire GoldenEye. It's an imprecise weapon. It doesn't just destroy bank records, but all electronic devices within a 30 mile radius. The poles could wipe out hospital equipment and other crucial infrastructure, leading to hundreds if not thousands of deaths. Plus, the economic hardship would likely claim plenty of lives as well. Next is Donkey Kong's arch enemy. Well, the one that's not Mario. King K. Rule. While K. Rule has done a lot to antagonize the Kongs over the years, Donkey Kong 64 features his most evil plan yet. He shows up with a gigantic weapon called the Blastomatic and plans to use it to completely destroy Donkey Kong Island. Now, it's important to keep in mind that this isn't just some small island that only houses the Kongs K. Rule hates so much. It's gigantic and houses tons of characters. And even if he only targeted the Kongs, that's still mass murder. There's a few of them, and the only crime they committed was stopping K. Rule's other evil schemes. Plus, K. Rule isn't even a good leader to the Kremlings. They fear him, and he constantly berates them for their failures. Whether you're his ally or his enemy, you want to steer clear of this guy. From one rare villain to another, we have Gruntilda. Grunty is an interesting case. 
In the original Banjo-Kazooie, she's relatively harmless. Her main crime is kidnapping Banjo's sister, Tootie, in an attempt to steal her youth and beauty. Now, that must be a horrible experience for Tootie, but that's about it. It's only her being affected, and she'll still be alive afterward. If this was Grunty's only crime, she would be near the bottom of the list, but it's not. In Banjo-Tooie, the stakes are raised drastically. This time, Grunty has a new machine, Bob, that sucks the life out of anything caught in its beam, and she plans to use it on the entire island. As seen in the game, this island is massive and full of life, so firing off Bob would lead to a ton of deaths. In addition to the more obvious evil plans, Gruntilda is also cruel to her subordinates. She rips out Cheeto's pages for helping Banjo and Kazooie, she abuses Dingpot to the point where he turns on her, and she even kills her own sisters as part of a twisted game show she puts on for Banjo and Kazooie. That last fact is why she's higher than K. Rule, by the way. The Kremlings weren't K. Rule's family members, and even if they were, the worst he does is scare them and yell at them. Gruntilda, on the other hand, murders her own sisters after they helped her escape from underneath a giant rock. Next is William Birkin from Resident Evil 2. He was mutated by the G-Virus and serves as a recurring boss throughout most of the game. In Birkin's defense, he isn't really in control of his actions in this state. The G-Virus severely damaged his brain to the point where he's only running on instinct, looking for food and vessels for reproduction. If we were only grading on his actions as a mutant, Birkin would be near the bottom of the list, as it's mostly the virus's fault he attacks everyone. However, he makes it this high because of basically everything he did before his mutation. He worked as a scientist developing bioweapons for Umbrella Pharmaceuticals. His biggest achievements include modifying the T-Virus so it would turn people into zombies instead of killing them almost instantly, and creating the G-Virus, which gives people great strength but also tremendous brain damage unless they have very specific genetics. These two viruses are responsible for turning people into the monsters you see throughout the game, so even if he didn't intend to unleash them on Raccoon City, he had to know they would be used somewhere. Pursuing this virus and ignoring all the potential deadly consequences is enough to put Birkin at the midpoint of our list. Next is a villain with a history almost as long as Bowser, Ganondorf. As you've probably guessed, we're only going to focus on his actions in Ocarina of Time. His main goal was to take over Hyrule and obtain the Triforce. When he couldn't get the necessary spiritual stones from the Kokiri, Gorons, and Zoras, he retaliated by killing the Great Deku Tree, putting a curse on Lord Jabu Jabu, and blocking off King Dodango's cavern. When Ganon finally gains control, Hyrule falls to ruin. Hyrule Castle Town has been abandoned and filled with Redeads, and the other areas are in similarly dire straits, most of which was purposeful on Ganon's part. I mean, it's not exactly surprising that a man who calls himself the King of Evil turned out to be a power-hungry tyrant. What is kind of surprising is the fact that he isn't higher on the list, and that's mainly because while Ganon may be vicious, his rule is limited to just one kingdom, while many of the other villains have bigger ambitions. Next is the Skadar. The plot of Perfect Dark centers around a war between two alien species with humanity caught in the middle, the Mayans, a peaceful species that travels a universe in search of knowledge, and the Skadar, a hostile species that declares war on the Mayans as soon as they meet. They also team up with an organization on Earth, Datadyne, to trade technology for resources to recover a ship at the bottom of the ocean that will help them win the war. What stops the Skadar from ranking any higher on this list is that they only seem to be concerned with the Mayans. On Earth, they only target Datadyne members who fail them and members of the Carrington Institute who work with the Mayans. Of course, the Mayans obviously don't deserve to get wiped out, but that's still better than targeting multiple planets. The Skadar may very well have done that, but we don't see it in-game. They may not be galactic tyrants, but they're still destructive. Next is Majora. After gaining power, it places curses on all the different areas of Termina, such as making Snowhead Mountain experience an especially long winter, leading to famine, and causing the dead to wander around Akana Canyon. What separates Majora from Ganon is the main focal point of the game, the moon. Majora aims to send the moon crashing down to the surface, completely destroying Termina. As evil as Ganondorf was, 
His goal wasn't to kill everyone, but that's what Majora tries to do. And the most haunting part of all this is that it isn't made clear what motivates Majora. It feels more like an abstract evil force that simply desires misery and destruction. Next, we have Mazar from Jet Force Gemini. Unlike the Skadar, who are more single-minded and concerned with war for the sake of war, Mazar is more concerned with spreading his empire across the galaxy and enslaving planets in order to fuel his trade agreements. Once the Jet Force is able to free planets from his control, Mazar hijacks an asteroid and sends it to Earth in an attempt to wipe out all of humanity. What puts Mazar above the Skadar is that while both were genocidal, the Skadar only stopped with one race, while Mazar wanted to enslave the entire galaxy. Up next is the main villain of Kirby 64, and to an extent, the franchise as a whole, the Dark Matter. Dark Matter is an alien species that arrives at various worlds and engulfs them in darkness. They're also able to possess the residents of the worlds in order to serve their evil agenda. It's unknown what engulfing a world in darkness really does to it, as it's kept kind of vague, but it is shown to be reversible. The Dark Matter's motives are also unknown. They could be doing this out of sheer animalistic instinct for all we know. They're still destructive, but the vague nature of their crimes and motivations barely keeps them out of the top three. All right, on to the top three. One thing these next three have in common is that they destroy entire planets. Our bronze medal of evil goes to the main villain of Star Fox 64, Andros. He started off as a well-renowned Cornarian scientist, whose inventions greatly benefited the Lilat system. However, he started researching biotechnology and space warps, which were both unethical and dangerous. When they couldn't find a use for his research, General Pepper ordered him to stop, but Andros continued his work which turned most of the Lilat system into a desolate wasteland. As punishment, Andros was exiled to the planet Venom, where he continued his research and descended further into madness, eventually declaring himself emperor and plotting to destroy the Lilat system. This descent into madness is tragic, but Andros stays out of the top two because his evil ambitions are just ambitions. He hasn't successfully destroyed any planets on purpose, unlike the top two. Our Silver Medal of Evil goes to Admiral Razorbeard from Rayman 2, The Great Escape. He serves as the captain of the Robo Pirates and is a brutal tyrant. He's infamous throughout the universe for invading over 100 peaceful planets, enslaving their people, and destroying their homeworlds. When he appears in Rayman 2, he invades the Glade of Dreams and destroys the heart of the world. It's vague what the heart of the world actually does. It's said to be the source of the world's energy and knowledge, but it's unclear what that actually means. Regardless, destroying it is still a horrible thing to do, and eating one of the lumps that makes it up is a whole new level of uncalled for. Plus, genocide, planet destruction, and mass slavery are more than enough to make the top two. Finally, our gold medal of evil goes to a character you may be surprised by, Wizpig from Diddy Kong Racing. Wizpig's goals are simple. He goes around to various planets and challenges the inhabitants to kart races, and if he wins, their planet gets destroyed. Now, planet-wide destruction is nothing new on this list, but what really sets Wizpig apart is motive. While most of these other villains will cause mass destruction for personal gain or out of animalistic instinct, Wizpig just does it because it's fun. You could argue that Wizpig isn't as bad as some of the others because he gives his victims a chance to save their planet. After all, if they win, he leaves them alone. But look, anyone who's played Diddy Kong Racing knows that this is barely a chance. Wizpig is basically unbeatable. Between his insane speed and massive size, his fight requires borderline perfection in order to win. It's unknown how many planets Wizpig has destroyed, but it's a distinct possibility that Diddy's world is the first one he spared. All right, guys, what do you think? Is Wizpig really the worst of the worst? Let us know in the comment section. Don't forget to hit that notification bell, and if you need a one-up, binge our Good to Evil playlist, where we break down the morality of the characters in your favorite games. Thanks for watching.